Okay, today we're going to um, read from Genesis 8 and 9, and that is focusing on the flood and God using the ark to save some people and to save some animals. So I thought we could sing a song about that today. Have you heard the song, Noah Built the Ark for Safety? No, I have not. You have? Okay. So we're going to sing this song, and I'm going to ask you to tell me some, uh, some of your favorite animals that God will put in the ark, okay? Okay, not yet, but just think about the animals that you want. She's already got animals ready, okay? So you guys get ready. We're going we're gonna to talk about Noah building the ark, so you have to help me build it, okay? Imagine that this is hammer and nail here. Corbin's got it, okay? Ready? Noah built the ark, Noah built the ark. Noah built the ark for safety. He put two animals in. He put two animals in. He put two animals in for safety. What did he put in? What kind of animal? He put in jaspers. He put in what? Giraffes. Giraffes, okay. He put two giraffes in. He put two giraffes in. He put two giraffes in for safety. They had a duck when they came in, I bet. Okay. What else? Corbin, you have an animal? They put uh, tigers. Tigers, okay. He put two tigers in. He put two tigers in. He put two tigers in for safety. Any other animals? What do you think, Heidi? Unicorns. I knew you were going to say unicorns. <laughs> Maybe they were there. He put two unicorns in, he put two unicorns in, he put two unicorns in for safety. Elephants, he put two elephants in, he put two elephants in, he put two elephants in for safety. Last week at Genesis chapter 6 and highlighted for us was the great wickedness of mankind. Verses 5 and 6 paint a pretty disheartening picture. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And this God that is loving is also just and he will not abide evil and sin forever. And so God is planning to destroy that sin, to make it come to an end here. But at the same time, when we see that every man was thinking evil all the time, we do see in verse 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah pleased the Lord. He's described as a righteous man who was blameless in his generation. Noah stood out from the rest of mankind during that time. Uh, it was important for, for Noah to walk with God. That's another way to say that he obeyed God. He obeyed the ways of the Lord. And then God showed up and said, Noah, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to destroy uh, mankind. I'm going to destroy, blot out everything that lives here on this earth because of the great sinfulness of mankind. So I want you to build an ark for safety, as we just sang about, that he's going to rescue some of his creation, some of mankind through that ark. And so he told him how to build it, 
He gave him the specifications, the wood, um, how big, and all this kind of stuff. And it says in verse 22 of chapter 6 that Noah did this. Noah obeyed the Lord exactly. He did all that God had commanded him. Okay, so now we're going to go into Genesis 7 here today, and I'm going to read this whole chapter to us now. This is the word of the Lord. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth, and Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Of clean animals and of animals that are not clean, and of birds and of everything that creeps on the ground, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days the waters of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. On the very same day Noah and his sons, Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Noah's wife and three wives of his sons with them entered the ark, they and every beast according to its kind, and all the livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The flood continued forty days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. The waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them fifteen cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, Beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth and all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Okay. God shows up to Noah after telling him, build this ark and here's how you're to do it. God shows up and he says to Noah in verse 4 of chapter 7, In seven days I will send rain on the earth and blot out every living thing from the face of the ground. Why seven days, I wonder? Why not just tomorrow? This is going to happen. He gives him seven days. That number seven has um, specific connotations for things. It reminds us of other things. And here in Genesis already, we might be reminded of the seven days of God's perfect creation, making all things good and perfect. And that seventh day was that day of rest for the Lord, but He created on that day, He created rest for us as well. And so when you hear that number seven, we're thinking about creation. And here, God shows up and says, in seven days, I'll send rain on the earth, and I'm going to blot out every living thing on the face of the ground. So it's like a reversal of creation, okay? Because we can see that. We think back about chapter 1, verse 2 that said, the earth, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Doesn't that sound like what God is saying is going to happen again? At once it was this deep, and it was dark, and the Spirit of the Lord hovered over that. And He is the one that brought life out of all of it. He put order to all of that. And now He's saying, I'm going to blot out every living thing. We're going to flood all of this. It's going to go back to the way it was. He's going to reverse creation here. And we see that happen in verse 11. And this one scares the snot out of me. I said that to get your attention. 
Because we read this and we just kind of, oh, okay, and move along. But read it again. The fountains of the great deep burst forth. Does that sound terrifying? It does. I mean, I'm thinking, I already am freaked out about like huge bodies of water, right? I mean, can you imagine floating out in the middle of the Pacific and the deepest, darkest valley of that ocean? You know, the great fountains of the deep open up and it just starts pushing, pumping out all of this water here. And the windows of the heavens were open. God opened up the heavens too and started dumping. It's a terrifying thing. Can you imagine humankind going along with their business, their busy lives? You'll read later in Matthew that people were busy just doing their stuff. They were having weddings and celebrations and various things, and they didn't know all the time that this was coming. The fountains of the great deep burst forth. The windows of the heavens were opened. And it says in verse 13, on that very same day, Noah and his family entered the ark. As God was bringing this huge judgment upon the sin of mankind on earth, he was also pulling aside Noah and his family to save them and part of his creation. We see this as judgment day. God will not abide sin forever, and he doesn't. It says, verses 18, 19, 20, and 24, this word prevail, the waters prevailed. He says it four times this way for us to get the idea that there's no standing up to this flood. You can't stop it. God is going to wash everything clean again. Verses 23 and 24, he blotted out. And this is pretty small, but I think about making mistakes on my old electric and manual typewriter back in the day and using whiteout to cover up those mistakes again. God is blotting out and covering up the sin of mankind with this flood. We are to get from this here that when God is going to do something, there's no stopping it. You can't stand up and say, I disagree. Hey, I did this good thing. Hey, I went to church. I did whatever. God is going to have his will, and God is going to punish the evil of mankind. You can't stand up to the just power of God. The waters prevailed and washed it clean. He blotted out. There's no stopping it. But at the same time, chapter 8 gives us a little bit of hope. We get back to Noah again. Chapter 8, verse 1. I'm going to read through 19. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. God made a wind blow over the earth, and the, wind sub the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens were restrained. The waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated, and in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters continued to abate until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a, dump, a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him in the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him any more. In the six hundred and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Then God said to Noah, Go out from the ark, you and your wife, and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out. And his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. The word of the Lord. 
Chapter 8, verse 1 may seem a little strange to you, but God remembered Noah. Now, in this, we read that and we should not be thinking God was like, He's out there working on Saturn and Jupiter and some stuff that's going on out, you know, way out there in the outer reaches. And he's like, oh man, Noah, I forgot. I just, I flooded everything and I forgot. Come back here. Whoo, that was close. Okay. Hey, Noah, I remember you. That's not what's going on here. When you read, but God remembered Noah, it's not that Noah ever left his mind. It's telling us, God holds His purposes and His creation in mind. Nothing has ever left His control. Everything's under His sovereign power. And so when you read, God remembered Noah, this is like covenant language. This is promise language. This is showing God's faithfulness to Noah and to his family. He said, I know I have done these things and I'm remembering my purposes. Noah, to you, you've never left my mind. I'm remembering you. And it says here in verse 4 that the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Now, here's a picture of mountains of Ararat, okay? Uh, In present day, you can go to uh, Armenian areas and see this. You have the greater Ararat mountain and the lesser one. The greater one is 16,800 feet high and the lesser one is 12,800 feet high. And I did a little research, and was, I'm seeing like tours and stuff. I mean, the, the hotter months of that area are July and August, same as ours. It's a great time to go and hike the mountains of Ararat. Maybe we could go find some remnants there of some gopher wood and go, oh, maybe this is it, okay? Um, but we do kind of read this, and we start thinking about, was it true? Can we find it? Can we not? And I see different kinds of reports about things, you know? Was the ark actually found or not? Well, before we get thinking that this is just kind of a big crazy myth, think about this. In every ancient civilization, there is a a great flood story. This isn't just a story that's in our Bible. It's not just a Jewish story or a Christian story. This is a story that pervades all of culture everywhere recognizes there was a great flood. That tells me that it it really happened, right? And the fact that when I was reading through this, did you see all the, uh, in this year, and this month, and this day, this happened, and then on this month and this day, this happened. Moses is recording for us history. He's saying here, you can count on this. This is real stuff. Here's where it happened. In the 600th year of spry old Noah, (laughs) ready to build an ark, You guys ready at 600 years old to build a huge thing like this? Noah was, okay? So we see all this and we see this really happened. You can go to this place. In the summer months, you can go for hikes up the mountains. In the wintertime, you can go skiing on these mountains, okay? I don't know where it was, but it's interesting. In Armenian language, Ararat means creation. That A-R at the beginning of it means creation new life, creation, okay? So in their language, even on this this mountain here where the ark came to rest, we're reminded that God has never forgot His purposes. He's bringing new life again. So we see in this recreation here, uh, Noah, as the waters start to recede, uh, Noah sends out a raven. The raven's going around, comes back. Then he sends out a dove. I love it how in in that chapter that I was reading, did you notice that the dove, it says that she returned? You think about it returned. That's what I would think about when the bird, but no, she returned. You know, God knows his creation so well. He can look at a bird and tell you what it is. You know, she returns the first time. Nope, didn't find anything. Well, she didn't actually say that, but um, no one knows. And then sends out again. And every time in between, how long is it? Seven days, we're reminded of creation. God's bringing new life again. And so it comes back again, finally, with a freshly plucked olive leaf in her beak. The waters have receded. God's bringing new life. Even to the ground, new vegetation is coming. And so God shows up in verse 16 to Noah, and He says, Go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons, and your son's wives with you. 
Wouldn't it have been a lot simpler for Noah, I mean, for God to say here, hey, go out from your ark, you and your family. Why does he break it up into you and your wife, Noah, Mrs. Noah, uh, your sons and their wives. Why does he break it up like that and lay it out? Because we're to see here again, God is bringing new life. It's happening through male and female, these pairs, these married folk that are coming out. It's part of the created order. It's the only way to bring new life. Male and female is the only way to bring new life. Any other combination does not. Go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. And we see here his command to them. Verse 17, bring out with you every living thing that's with you of all flesh, birds and animals, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. We've heard that language before. It's all the way back to chapter 1, verse 28, when he had created Adam and Eve and all of these animals. This is the command that he gave to them. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And he says that here to Noah and his family one more time. Why? Because we're be, to be reminded here, God is creating new life again through this family. Noah and his family and all these animals were in the ark for 370 days. Talk about quarantine. That would be awful. <laughs> but God sustained them through all of that. Could you imagine, put yourself in their shoes just for a little bit how terrifying that would have been. That God brought all those animals in, He put them in. It said God shut the door. We sang it in the song. It's not just for fun of it, okay? It said that God closed them in. Kaboosh! You know, He closes the door. And the waters come and the ark raises. Do you think there were any humans around watching this happen? Do you think any of them were banging on the door trying to get in? Too late would have been a terrifying, scary thing. And the waves, the chaotic waves, destroying everything. 370 days they were in the ark. But all the time, God remembered Noah. He remembered them. He protected them. He provided for them. And now He's going to bring new life through them. You know, Noah and this whole uh, passage here is important for the New Testament as well. Turn over to Matthew 24. Verses 36 through 44, I'm going to read. And this is Jesus speaking here. When people are asking him about when the second coming will be, when the Lord will come and fix everything. Uh, this is the first day, uh, the first Sunday of Advent on the calendar, uh, looking for that time when the Lord will come again. It's what this passage is about, but we're also mindful at this time of year of uh, the Lord's first coming in the flesh. And we've got down in front of the communion table here this little manger that I built last year. It's empty in anticipation of the Lord coming. And here, when he's asked about when that's going to happen, this is what Jesus says. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be left in the field. One will be taken and the other one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. It's big for us at this time of year, actually all the time, but especially this time of year, we talk about events coming. What's going on this week? What are we up to? Next week, we've got this concert. After that, it's going to be this. And people are going to come together. We're going to have this celebration. We're going to open presents this day. Then I'll get together with this other side of the family. And we'll open presents that day. And we'll eat a whole bunch more because, well, that's just what we do through this time of year. Is any of that for sure going to happen? I don't know. I feel like I know. I act like I know. 
I've got it all laid out. We've got it all planned. But Jesus is reminding us, you're not in charge. You're not in charge of the schedule. God is in charge of it. Jesus said, the Son doesn't even know when that's going to happen, but it will happen. The Son of Man will come again. It could be this afternoon. Dwight wouldn't have to have his surgery. Myron won't have to wait for that phone call anymore. The Lord could come back this afternoon. Does that scare you or does that make you rejoice? It could happen today. And Jesus says here, hey, back in the days of Noah, they thought they had more time. Weddings, celebrations, feasts, they were doing all that. They were living like they were in control of everything and nothing's going to stop it. But then the language of the Lord prevailing, 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 blotting out. There's no stopping it. The Lord is in control of all things. And Jesus says, you don't know the hour. What's your life like right now? Do you feel like everything is figured out? Do you feel like things are kind of a mess, but you're putting it off? You're sweeping it under the carpet. I'll deal with this later. I know there's this broken relationship with so-and-so, but I'm just going to avoid them. I know I've been doing this at work, and I'll improve someday. You know, I'm going to make this right or that right. Don't put it off any longer. How is your relationship with the Lord? If he comes back today, will he say, well, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. Or will he say, depart from me. I never knew you. Jesus says, don't put it off. Don't think like the people during Noah's time that you've got more time. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Don't risk it. It could happen today. And so we move from this big global picture here of God's destruction of sin to getting more personal here where Jesus is speaking to us and saying, you don't know the hour. You don't know the time. And then he's going to make it more personal. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. Again, the New Testament drawing back on this language in the story from Noah in Genesis. 1 Peter 3, 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which He went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to Him. God's Word is going to make that flood story very personal for us today as we read this. All of us... All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us have had the waters come up 15 cubits above our head, like the, the, the highest mountains on the world. The waves have prevailed over us. And on our own, try as you might to swim and get out of it, you cannot. But God protected Noah and his family through the ark, through those waters, he saved them and brought new life. And in the same way here, Peter is saying, in the same way, you drowning in your sins, God brings you through the flood. Baptism is kind of a picture of that. He brings you through the flood waters. Sin is put to death and buried away and you're raised to new life again because of God's faithful saving of you. He's making it very personal. We move from worldwide flood to now, what are you going to do? Will you trust the Lord with your life? Let Him bring you through the flood waters and save you. So I ask you today, how is your relationship with the Lord? Do you trust Him with your life? If He comes back today, are you going to run and hide? 
Or will you greet him with open arms? Yes, come Lord Jesus. I've been waiting for this. You want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. If you are in Christ Jesus, that will be your reward. <clears throat> What a wonderful lesson. As I was doing some studying this week and this morning, uh, reflecting back on what I was going to discuss on the Lord's table, I had a, uh, one of those little alerts on my, little Bible, on my Bible app pop up, and it, it, had, a, um, it had a verse in um, Isaiah 9, and it talked about how um, the fall away of man and how evil man was and how they were speaking against God, how they were turning away from God. And they said that God didn't turn away his anger, but he still held out his hand and held out his arms. And you think about that in relation to what we've been talking about in Genesis and, and how even with the destruction of the world and the cleansing with the flood, God was always there, and even though he was so upset with the evil of mankind at that time, he still had his arms out. He was still there for us to reach out and feel his, his love that he has for us. So as I was reading on, and it gets in more into chapter 10 a little bit, and it talks even more so how things turned a little bit, but there was still evil and God was still never turned his, his anger away, but he always still held out his arms. And then, if it, then I went over into uh, John, um, John and read some of John 3. And you get into verse 316 and 17 where he talks about God gave his only begotten son. That we should not perish but have everlasting life. And it wasn't to condemn the world, but to save it. So we have all these illustrations of how much we have all fallen short. We've all taken opportunities when we should have done what he wanted us to. And we've all turned away. But through it all, he loved us so much that he gave his the ultimate price of his only son for us, for each one of us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you have the love for us, that no matter how much we fall, how much we turn away, that you always have a welcoming arm. You're always reaching out. You're always there for us when we stumble and fall. To help lift us up, to guide us, and to bring us back into your light. Lord, we ask as we take this Lord's Supper today that you would bless this bread to all those who partake of it, that we do so in remembrance of the sacrifice that was given for each one of us, for your son that hung on the cross, that was so lovingly and freely given that we would have this chance to have eternal life with you, to return to heaven, and to live out our day. We're so grateful for this opportunity we have each week to reflect on this, to ask forgiveness for the sins we've committed, but also to come back into your light. Help us to be better in all that we do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us continue. Our great Heavenly Father, was we humble about before your throne again, we thank you for this fruit of the vine that represents the blood that was shed upon the cross, the blood that was given as a washing away of our sins, of your son that uh, was so humbly given for all of us. We thank you for this opportunity we have. We pray that you would help us to reflect on this, to reflect on our lives, and of course, always be a better example. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We're so very fortunate in our in our country with all the blessings we have 
And we've had this last holiday to reflect on our thankfulness and what we're, we have to be so grateful for. Um, this last week I was off and um, we had the opportunity to go down and help out with Love, Inc. Sorry. And seeing the families that came and that we were able to, to help out with. When I, when I was growing up, we, we were those families. We were, the, we were some of those families that, that, was, that was our Thanksgiving. And I feel very blessed that I had not only the opportunity to help and give back and, and help with others, but as a family, we were able to do it and that help because we don't know the impact a little thing has in someone's life. And it, it may be 40 years later, but remembering that at Thanksgiving, it was that box that came that gave us rolls and turkey and stuffing and it was neat to have stuffing from a box. <laughs> or it was those gifts that we got at Christmas and knowing that if it wasn't for the gifts that were left on the porch from members of our church or from the community, we weren't going to have much. But of all things, we have so much that we are all thankful for. We're not only thankful for the blessings that we're given through um, our jobs and the physical things we have, but we're so blessed in what we're given with love and God's love for us. And again, going back to his son, that he gave his son for us, for our sins. We're blessed how we can touch one another and those in our communities just with a little gesture of saying hello, saying hi, being their ray of light or their little sunshine in, in a day. And we're blessed so much that we have this opportunity. We're blessed with our health. So many of the members here have been sick this last year and we've all been blessed enough that we've been able to come back together and there's been many challenges with all that, but through all of that, we're all blessed and we all have things to be thankful for. So as we reflect on what we give today, whatever it may be, know that there's a little part of that that touches everyone's life, whether it's here in the community, where it's without the, throughout the county, the, our local areas, but even with what we help with the Sotos in the Ukraine, we are helping teach God's love and God's light throughout the world. And as we, if we watch the news, it looks darker and darker every day. But we have a light and we have a gift and we need to be able to shine that. Our Heavenly Fathers, we humbly bow before your throne again. We ask that you would bless this offering. We ask that everyone who gives today, no matter what it be, that... They do so willingly, that they do so knowing that it goes to your work, that it goes to help others, and that every little bit, that little ray, whether it be from a monetary donation, whether it be just from work, that they can do to help others could be a light in someone's life. We're so fortunate in this country with the blessings we have, and we just pray that you would help us to uh, help others, to help spread your gospel throughout the world, to help in other countries and other areas and, and even in our own backyard of those who are in need. There's always those around us that we know of that may be struggling, not only financially, but spiritually. And our little, little ray of sun in someone's day, that little 
glimmer of light of just being kind might make a difference. We thank you for your son. We thank you for your love for us and all the blessings you give us. We pray that we just continue to share that with others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.